Well, I started out in this field uh, in the mid-60s. Uh, I was working for the California legislature uh, and was swept up in uh, reforms in developmental disabilities and in mental health. California really was one of the first states to develop uh, legislation uh, that mandated community-based uh, systems in the state. Um, and I certainly um, had been radicalized like a lot of people in my generation um, by the conditions in public institutions, uh, which was certainly motivation for me to keep doing what I was doing. My mentor, Art Bolton, in the early 70s, um, got a hold of a copy of Normalization by Wolfensberger uh, and instructed us all to read it. And it was pretty clear to me that once you had read Normalization, you never really looked at the world the same way again. Um, it really, I guess it's true that some of the most revolutionary concepts are the simplest. Uh, and the notion um, that people need to be supported in situations that are normal to all of the rest of us uh, created a prism for me um, through which I looked at everything after that. I mean, once you've sort of imbibed that idea uh, that things should be age appropriate, that they should be uh, appropriate to your community, et cetera, it's impossible to look at an institution and say that's normal. Uh, it's impossible to go into a large residential setting of uh, adults with uh, intellectual disabilities and see bunny rabbits on the walls and think that that's appropriate. Um, it's impossible to see people uh, dressed in uh, uh, slovenly, uh, clothing uh, that their providers are, are not providing them. Um, yeah. um, in any event, uh, yes, it was a truly um, radicalizing, revolutionary set of ideas. Well, you know, it, that's very interesting because certainly it was a, a, a very uh, exciting time uh, to be a young person because um, there were lots of powerful movements around the rights of people with disabilities, women, um, minorities of various kinds, and certainly I translated a lot of that fervor into uh, my work in the field of DD. The framework that Wolf provided really gave a way of talking about it rather than simply uh, talking in platitudes. To, I mean, certainly justice is not necessarily a platitude, but it's a highly general concept. So normalization really gave us a way to measure uh, progress to uh, describe the system that we wanted. Uh, it wasn't just rights for people with disabilities. It was a way to describe the vision of what we really wanted the system to become. Um, it really guided in a very strong way, I think, not just in the 70s, but into the 80s and 90s, uh, a lot of one's thinking about what a community system ought to be. Uh, and I think it continues to illuminate that idea. But people were very threatened by this notion, uh, especially in the early years in the 70s and 80s. Frankly, I think some people are still threatened by it. Um, we keep trying to reinvent institutions. Uh, but for anybody who believed in large congregate uh, settings uh, made up entirely of people with disabilities, uh, the notion of normalization um, was a direct assault on what they did how they provided services, uh, and their whole, um, the whole underpinning of that particular provider mentality. So um, there were also people who um, were more in the caretaking mode. Um, so the bunnies on the wall were sort of a, a symbol of, of their sense of these were special people, they're really children, they're not adults, they love the bunnies. Um, so it was also um, threatening to people who had not yet thought of people with disabilities as a fully adults. 
You know, it's really um, the difference between caretaking and I think what underpins Wolf's notion. Uh, you can probably characterize uh, by looking at the differences between things like adult foster care, boarding care, uh, compared with an emerging notion of shared living. Uh, certainly adult foster care, boarding care, whatever one calls it in whatever state you're in, really is about someone coming to live in your home at your sufferance if you're the adult foster care provider. You're taking care of this person. It's not really their home, it's your home. Um, whereas with shared living, it's really a commitment on the part of uh, one individual to share a life with a person with a disability uh, and to assume that the, the life that you're leading um, takes place in a home that's shared, uh, that your um, social networks are shared, um, that you're mutually supportive as opposed to one person taking care of another person. You know, Wolf in his later years certainly uh, was not fully supported of the self-advocacy movement. Um, he, unlike Gunnar, for instance, did not sort of move as the field and the vision moved. Uh, but I don't think that takes anything away from the elegance of that construct, um, which certainly one has to uh, um, admit is, is in part uh, from Bank Nierier, from uh, Niels Eric Bank Mikkelsen. Uh, Wolf really popularized it in this country, but it was uh, an evolution of something that was already um, among the thinking of people in Scandinavia. But I still think it's one of the most powerful, simple constructs. You can explain it to almost anybody. Now, Wolf tended to make it somewhat more complicated when he developed his training sessions and uh, uh, tried to systematize it. But for me, it was always that, that very simple template that you could put on to almost any situation that really helped you think about were we living up to um, a normal life for somebody with a disability.